Well, this is our third week in our series we have called Unpacking Evangelism. We're looking at what the scriptures teach us as disciples, as followers, about our personal responsibility of sharing the gospel message. This week I was uh, doing some study, ran across a survey by George Barna from last year, from 2019, where he surveyed people who were uh, practicing Christians. They said they were practicing Christians, very regular in their faith. And so they were asked how often they shared uh, the gospel message, how often they witnessed to someone. 56% of practicing Christians said they had only had one or two conversations about their faith in the last year. The good news was of those 56% who had at least one conversation, 86% of them said that that conversation helped them be more confident in their own faith. In other words, sharing the gospel with another person really helped instill those principles of faith in them and made them more confident. Even better, 71% of those who tried at least one time to share their faith walked away with enough confidence that they said they were eager and willing to attempt to share their faith again. So it's just in the practice uh, of sharing our faith that uh, we get better at it. You know, Paul in Romans 1, 14 and 15 said, I am obligated both to the Greeks and non-Greeks both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel. And I got thinking about that word uh, obligated, and I looked it up in some other translations, and I love the explanation of obligated in the Amplified Bible. Here's how the Amplified Bible uh, reads Romans 1, 14 and 15. I have an obligation to discharge and a duty to perform and a debt to pay. So for my part, I'm willing and eagerly ready to preach the gospel. You think about that. Paul said it's an obligation. I have to discharge it. I have to fulfill this obligation. It's a duty I need to perform, and it's a, a debt I need to pay. What, what debt? Well, first of all, obviously a debt to the Lord um, for the gift of salvation, but also a debt to others. Um, because we have had the gospel shared with us by others, our indebtedness is paid forward in that because we're grateful for what others have done in sharing for us, we're going to do that for another. You know, I think most um, believers who are really seeking to honor and, and to serve the Lord have a sense of obligation or, or of duty or of debt. They, they understand and, and they want to be willing and eager to share the gospel message, but there's some doubt and fear. Not doubt and fear in, in the message, but in our ability as messengers. So it's hard for us to say that we're really uh, willing and, and eager at that point. Well, two weeks ago when we began this series talking about our personal responsibility, we looked at several passages that made it clear that every believer, every disciple, every follower of Christ, not just the initial, but down through the ages, every one of us has been commissioned and commanded to be a conduit for the message of the gospel. Now, what's our responsibility? It's simply to be obedient, to be a witness. We, we can't make the fruit happen. We can't produce the fruit. We can't cause the results. That's up to the, the Holy Spirit working in lives, but we are responsible to be obedient. And we also looked at from Acts 1-8 that in order to fulfill our obedience and our calling to be witnesses, we've been given the Holy Spirit. He's the one who empowers and equips us. The Holy Spirit works in us uh, to place that burden on our heart to put us in the situations where we have opportunity, and then to give us the words to speak out of our burden and passion for those who are lost. And then the Holy Spirit's also working in the person who doesn't know Christ to help them understand their need and create a desire um, to recognize there's more and, and to want more. And so the Holy Spirit, as we saw last week in the story of Jesus and his encounter with the Samaritan woman, the Holy Spirit sets up divine appointments and then for us, uh, gives us the words that we need to say. Now, in the example of a divine appointment last week with Jesus and the Samaritan woman, you remember that he uh, intentionally intersected her life. He'd been on a long journey. He was tired. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He was resting at that well, but he forgot about all his wants and, and needs physically and set that aside in order to meet this woman's eternal spiritual needs. And this woman, remember, was not someone that, that most people in society would reach out to. Uh, she was an outcast, but that's the very person that Jesus looked to because of the tremendous need that she had. And so he intersected her life. You remember that he initiated a level of relationship and conversation. 
He helped identify her need, showed her where the things that she was doing in life to find fulfillment were not working. And then, of course, introduced himself as the one who could meet her need, the one who could quench her thirst. Now, we said last week um, that process that we described is simple, but for most it's not easy. Uh, The vast majority of believers don't share their faith regularly, and many have never done that even one time. Well, why is that? Billy Graham Evangelistic Association did a study of people who were practicing Christians, active in their faith, and asked them um, what were some of the reasons that they weren't regularly involved in sharing their faith. Nine percent of those surveyed said that they were just too busy. Twenty-eight percent said, well, I I don't know what to say or or don't know how. Twelve percent said their lives are not good enough. They said, I'm not living a strong enough life as a believer, I, 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 can't, I can't share. But listen, 51% of those who responded to the survey said the main reason they don't share their faith is fear. Uh, they're afraid of uh, what, what, the what the person they share their faith with might think, afraid that they might reject the gospel message. Well, let's just take a minute this morning and think about some of the common excuses we might have for sharing our faith. And you might be surprised to know that some of these excuses are actually listed in Scripture. Going back to Exodus chapter 3, in Exodus 3, God has uh, placed his call on Moses. You remember the encounter at the burning bush? He's called Moses to go be his spokesman to Pharaoh and to lead his people uh, out of bondage in Egypt. And I like this picture because it's kind of a picture we're called to do. We're called to be a spokesman for our Lord and we're called to show people the way out of bondage, out of bondage to sin. Well, in Exodus um, chapter 3, God has told Moses that he's calling him to go, and Moses begins to offer up some excuses. The first one in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 11, Moses says, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? What is Moses saying? Well, God, I'm, I'm not a person of power. I'm not a person of influence. I'm nobody. Although Moses had grown up in in the Pharaoh's household, he had been away from Egypt and on the backside of nowhere for 40 years. He was nobody. You know, and I thought about that excuse, and I thought, here's what happens with us. God calls us. um, He he convicts us. He places his burden on our heart to go lead our friend or or neighbor out of of bondage to sin. And we say, well, God, I'm I'm not a minister. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a a trained professional. I'm, I'm not the... I'm nobody. I shouldn't go do this. A a pastor needs to go do that. Next, you see in Exodus 3 that Moses, in verses 13 and 14, his next excuse was, well, God, the people won't know that I'm speaking for the true God. They won't know that. I don't know enough about you to, to convince people about who you are. Well, we feel convicted to share, and we tell God, hey, God, I don't know enough doctrine. I I can't explain spiritual things to a lost person. God, someone who's more spiritual and who knows more needs to go share with my lost relatives. Next, Moses in chapter 4, verse 10, makes a similar argument. He says, Lord, I've never been eloquent, uh, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. What do we do? We convince ourselves that we're not very good about talking about spiritual things. You know, it's funny, we, we actually think that the person's salvation is going to depend on the words we say, and we're worried, well, I might say the wrong thing, or I might confuse my friend. Finally, Moses, and this is his fifth excuse, finally Moses, because God's not accepting his excuses, Moses gets to the real heart of the matter in chapter 4 and verse 13. He very simply says this, Lord, please send someone else. Lord, please send send someone else to do it. And that's kind of our bottom line too, isn't it? You know, we have a friend or a coworker or a family member who needs Christ. We're not totally heartless. We have a burden. We have a, uh, some degree of, of, of desire for them to come to Christ, but we're afraid we're going to mess up. We're, we're afraid that we're going to embarrass ourselves. Or we're going to look foolish. You know what we forget and what Moses forgot? God's words in the third chapter in the 12th verse, after he's called Moses to this task, five simple words that God said in chapter 3 and verse 12 of Exodus. I will be with you. That's what God tells Moses. I will be with you. Now now think about it. God was the one who gave life to Moses, who created Moses for a purpose. 
God was the one who protected Moses from death as an infant. He was the one who put Moses in Pharaoh's household to be raised where he got an incredible education and learned leadership skills and, and learned the ways of the Egyptians. God was the one who burdened Moses about the plight of the Israelites. When, when Moses tried on his own to take matters in his own hands and he failed miserably, God was the one who helped Moses escape Egypt and who used the years that he spent in the wilderness of Midian as a shepherd to prepare him to shepherd his people. God was the one who sent Moses back to Egypt. God was the one who's going to free his people. Moses was simply the vessel that God was choosing to use. So Moses is not going on his own, but he's in this profound, exciting partnership with God. Now, think about it for just a moment. Do you, do you know that God created you for a purpose? Ephesians 2.10, we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God had a, a purpose and, and specific works and ministries in mind for each one of us when he created us. Did you know that not only did God create you for a purpose, but God has also purposed that all men have the opportunity to hear the gospel message. Jesus told the disciples in Matthew 24, the end will come after the gospel has been preached to all nations. God wants everyone to hear. 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing for any to perish but for all to come to repentance. So God created you for a purpose. God's purpose is that all men have an opportunity to hear the gospel. And then God has called us as believers to go, not on our own, but in partnership with him. Acts 1.8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses. So just like Moses, God has created us for a specific purpose. God's desire is for everyone to be drawn out of bondage to sin and drawn to a relationship with Christ. And then he calls us to go and to go in partnership with him. Now, it's important to remember when God uh, has called us to bear fruit, to be witnesses, it's important to remember we can't do that on our own. John 15, in Jesus' uh, dialogue about the vine and the branches, we have to be connected to the vine. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. So God has called us into partnership. It's not something we can do on our own. It's not something he's called us to do on our own. But God has called us into partnership to share Jesus with the world. But what about the fear? What about the fear that we have? We know we're called. What about the fear? Do you know that in the New Testament, there's another uh, leader that, like Moses, had a lot of fear and trepidation about his calling? If you've read Paul's letters uh, to Timothy, you know that Paul frequently had to encourage Timothy. He had to build him up. Sometimes he had to hold his feet to the fire because Timothy, although he was a leader in the church, Timothy was, was kind of timid and it was hard for him to speak up. But in Paul's second letter to Timothy, there is a word of instruction, a word of encouragement he gives Timothy that really can speak to our fears and witnessing. In 2 Timothy 1.7, Paul reminds Timothy, God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And I want to break down for just a few minutes this morning three gifts um, that we see in this verse in regard to our witness. The very first thing Paul says is, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of, here's the first spirit, power. Well, what's power? Power is abundant uh, energy to accomplish a task. You know, God's going to provide all the power we need to accomplish the task that he's called us to. And, and fear is not necessarily a bad thing. Fear is not bad if we don't allow it to paralyze us. Fear can be a good thing, especially spiritually. Uh, when we have fear, but we choose to rely on the power of God, we're reminded we have to depend on God, not our own ability. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 5 said it this way, there is nothing in us that allows us to claim that we are capable of doing the work. The capacity we have comes from God. Listen, the gospel's power to save doesn't come from our words. We don't need to worry about uh, maybe not saying something just right. It doesn't come from our presentation. The, the power of the gospel to save is God's power, not, not our authority, not our ability, because we have none. We don't have any power. We don't have any ability on our own. 
but in our partnership with God, it comes from him. We can't produce the results. That's not our job. That's, that's his job. But it's his power at work in us. Paul in, in Romans 1.16 said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. You know, when, when we say like Moses, who am I to speak for God? We need to remember like Moses, we're nobody. We're nobody. We, we don't have power. We don't have authority. We're nobody, but we're the vessel God has chosen through whom he will demonstrate his power to save. Now, you have to stay in close relation with God and let his power work through you. You're, you're not going to make salvation happen in a person's life. You, you can't. He is. But recognize also you don't have the power and you don't have the pressure to produce. The results are up to God. It's his power at work in us. But here's the second gift that Paul mentions in this verse. God gives us a spirit of power. He also gives us a spirit of love. And there are three things that love does that impacts our witness. The very first thing, and this is the most important, I think, love for God drives out the fear of man. When we really love God, when we're walking with him, when we're serving him, we don't worry as much about what others think. Now, it's, it's not uncommon that we worry about what someone thinks of us or worry that they might reject us, but when we truly love God and we want to honor him, we're more concerned with pleasing him, we're more concerned with his approval than we are the approval of man. I like the way Paul said it in Galatians 1.10, he just simply asked the question, who am I trying to approve or to please? Am I seeking to please men or God? When we're really tuned in in our love for the Lord and our relationship with him, we want to honor, we want to obey, we want to please him, and that helps us not be as fearful of men. Here's the second thing love does. Love for God causes us to be concerned about the things that concern him. You know, in that Billy Graham survey, one of the top four answers was uh, that why people didn't share their faith was, I'm just too busy. Well, you know, it's a matter of priority, isn't it? I thought this week about the parable of the sower where he describes the seed falling on different types of ground and he described the seed falling on thorny soil and how the seed tries to, to, to grow and, and get to the point of producing through, fruit, but it gets choked out. And he says in Mark 4, 19, the worries of this life, the love for riches, and the desires for other things crowd in and choke the message so there is no fruit. Now, think about that for just a moment. That's talking about salvation. That's talking about the seeds bearing fruit of salvation. But it's kind of true about our witness as well. We have the seeds of the gospel to share, but if we're not careful the things in life that consume us, the things that keep us busy, the desires that we have can choke the message in that we won't spend the time sowing the seeds and, and seeing fruit born. But as we grow in our love for God, his burden becomes our burden. As we grow and know the heart of God more and more, his priorities become our priorities. We begin to think like God thinks about lost people, and that, that becomes very important to us. You know, Paul, in speaking about our lives of believers, in his letter to the Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, he says we're to lay aside everything that, that weighs us down, lay aside every weight, every encumbrance, every sin that entangles us so that we can run the race with endurance. Listen, part of running the race with a believer is that passing of the baton that passing of the gospel message. Can you imagine if you went to a track meet and, and you showed up at this track meet and the runners are getting on the starting line and you can see the starter's pistol, they're getting ready to start the race and all of a sudden you look and you see that one of the people on that starting line is wearing jeans and a, has a coat on and has ankle weights on. Wouldn't that be ridiculous? You'd think, well, that person's never gonna run this race well. No, when you go to run a race, you have on lightweight running shorts and a, and a running jersey, and you certainly don't have weights strapped on you. Well, Paul says you've got to get rid of the weights and the encumbrances if you're going to run the race well. How does that apply to witnessing? Well, we've got to figure out what are the things, uh, the, the time wasters in my life that I need to lay aside? What are, what are the things that entangle me? I've got to create some margin in my life. I've got to create some room in order to invest 
in the things that matter to God. And we know on the heart of God, his priority, his burden is for the souls of men. Here's the third thing that that spirit of love helps with. Love for others causes us to focus on their needs instead of our fears. Love for others causes us to focus on their needs instead of our fears. You know, you might be fearful to run into a burning building to save someone, but you really wouldn't think much about it. You would just do it out of love. You might be fearful to jump in to save someone who's drowning, but you really don't think about it. If it's someone you love, you just, you just jump in. Well, when we have a great love for others, that diminishes the fear that we have of how they might respond or, or, or how they might react. When we have a great love for others, we act courageously in spite of our fear. You know, the, the courageous person is not the person who feels no fear, but the one who chooses to do right in spite of his fear. And love for others, asking God to help us love others as he does will help us overcome the fear of the people, of how they might react or how they might respond. So he tells Timothy, we've got a spirit not of fear, but of power and of love. And look at that last thing he says, a spirit of self-control. Now, your translation, if you're reading a different translation, may say a a sound mind or may say a a spirit of self-discipline. In the Greek, self-discipline is a very accurate translation. And literally what Paul is saying is, God has given us the discipline to use our minds and become wise. Now, A lot of times I'll hear folks say, well, I don't know what to say, or I don't know enough scripture, or I don't know how to explain it. I don't have all the answers. You know what God would say to that excuse? Well, you know what? I gave you a mind. I gave you discipline to enable you to be able to learn. Anyone of any intellectual ability can learn how to effectively share the message of the gospel. And we frequently around here talk about how to share the message of the gospel. There are lots of great resources. If that's your struggle point, then just ask. There's plenty of help. But don't excuse your responsibility to share the gospel because you haven't learned how. It's pretty simple to learn how. Well, 1 Peter 3.15 is a verse we looked at a couple of weeks ago that I just want to remind you of in closing this morning. In 1 Peter 3.15, Peter told those in the church who needed to be sharing their faith with the world, he said two things. First of all, in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. What was he saying? Make sure you're living a worthy life. If you're going to be telling people the message of the gospel and the difference it makes in a life, then your life needs to look like that. And I would say to you this morning, if you feel like that your life is not Uh, worthy, if you feel like Christ is not Lord and you're a believer, well, you just need to spend some time with the Lord and repent of whatever sin he shows you and make sure that your life is worthy of the message of the gospel. You don't get away from the responsibility to share just because you're not living right. If you're a child of God, you've got to do what he said. You've got to set apart Christ as Lord, live a life worthy of him. And then he says, and be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you for a reason of the hope that you have. You've got a spirit of power. You've got a a spirit of love, and you have, God has given you a sound mind, self-discipline, self-control, so that you can learn. Listen, our calling is clear. Our calling is clear. There's no question from Scripture that we are called to be sowing the seeds of the gospel, to be speaking the truth of the gospel to our friends, to our coworkers, to our family, to our neighbors, to those who need to know Christ. Calling is clear. We have to choose to be obedient and to do what he has said. Would you pray with me this morning? I can ask you there just in your home, whether you're by yourself or even if you have uh, family members around, just to bow and, and close your eyes so you can spend a few moments alone just between you and the Lord. As we do each week, we need to ask, Lord, what what are you saying to me? From from the truth of your word, what's the point of application in my life? And the Holy Spirit who indwells each of us as believers will speak that word of application to us. So what is it he's saying? Is, Is fear the primary reason you don't step up to the plate? You don't share your faith? Well, he wants you to be reminded this morning that he's not given us a spirit of fear. That's not from the Lord. Now, Satan would like to speak fear to you to keep you from being a gospel messenger. 
The fear's not from God. It's giving you a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. Maybe this morning he's speaking to you about the fact that it's his power at work. You need to trust him and you need to be in partnership with him and just growing in your walk with him so you're getting stronger and and the Holy Spirit is able to work in you and demonstrate his power. Maybe this morning he's speaking to you about the spirit of love, that your heart for God would grow so much that you want to do the things that please and honor him that you spend so much time with the Lord that you begin to have the same heart he does for the lost and have the same burden and same passion for them. That, that he enables you perhaps out of a spirit of love to see deeply into the needs of those who are lost, not only their needs now, but their eternal needs. And that motivates you to overcome your fear because of their need. Or maybe today it's that You've not ever taken the time to apply yourself to learning how to share the gospel, to memorizing scripture that you can speak to someone about the gospel. What's he said? What do you need to do? Father, as we come today and look again into your word about what you have said to us about our role and responsibility as followers to share the gospel message, Father, I thank you for the reminder today that we're in partnership with you. You haven't sent us out on our own, but your Holy Spirit who dwells every believer goes with us and partners with us in sharing the gospel message. Father, I pray when we have some moments of fear that we would just remind ourselves that you've not given us a spirit of fear. That's not from you. And that we'd be reminded that we have the power of the spirit at work in us. We have a spirit of love for you and for others. And we have a sound mind. We have self-discipline, self-control so that we can learn. Father, as you have called us to share the message of the gospel, help us to step forward, to step out in faith, and to trust you with the results. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.